Next up, we have a non-core team member. And actually, the next talk is from a person who isn't even a big part of the NEOS community yet. And that is something that I really, really enjoy from the conference team when they reach out to people who are not from our community to get some new impulses, some new inspiration to us uh, from the outside. And the next talk from Laura Hilliger is one of those occasions. Um, I looked up her website and she says about herself, I'm a generalist and a specialist, an open strategist, a facilitator, a writer, a technologist, an intellectual multipod and a skater. That's a lot of things to say about yourself. That's a lot of things to be. And I've met her in person and I believe her. And she's a very charismatic person. So I'm really looking forward to a talk. Um, one more thing to, to say about Laura. Um, this year she won the Digital Leader of the Year Award at the Women in IT Summit. So shout out to Laura for being such an acclaimed speaker and person and for her work at the We Are Open Cooperative. Um, she has worked for Mozilla for a couple of years. She is working for Greenpeace. She really knows what she's talking about when she's talking about nonprofits. So next up is Laura Hilliger with her talk about realities of nonprofits building bridges between technology and global issues. Enjoy. Uh, before I even introduce myself, I want to point out uh, that what's happening in the world involves all of us. Uh, people are suffering and you can help them. Don't look away, uh, but rather be curious. Seek to understand the plights of others. Stand up for others. Uh, stand against complacency and racism and fascism. Uh, because what you do matters, it always has, and it always will. Uh, I'll probably remind you of that several times during this talk. Uh, my name is Laura Hilliger. I work on the internet. Uh, you can Google me and find loads of stuff about what I do. Um, but essentially, I help organizations innovate for a better world. Uh, I'm a technologist, a writer, an inventor, an activist. Um, you're not going to find me on Instagram or WhatsApp. I loathe Facebook and haven't used anything Facebook owns uh, since I quit Facebook a decade ago. Um, I'm very sad that they just bought Giphy because I actually used Giphy quite a bit. And now I will have to stop and uh, find another GIF service. Um, I am on some corporate media uh, like Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, but I'm a proponent for more decentralized systems. Um, and as I said a moment ago, I think that actions matter and I am a tech activist. So those are, <laughs> those are some of my choices. Um, I'm a director and a founding member of We Are Open Cooperative. I'm an open org ambassador for opensource.com. Uh, a lot of my work is about spreading the beliefs and the processes and the culture of open source. I help organizations go through digital transformation, uh, which basically means that I help them integrate open source principles uh, and community building techniques while helping them imagine, design, and build software and digital programs. Um, I spent over five years working with Mozilla, the makers of Firefox. Um, I work to spread web literacy, which is the social and technical skills and competencies that make working uh, on, on the web and working openly possible in the first place. Um, I've contributed to loads of different open projects um, all over the web. My work is about leadership, openness, obviously, and I speak and I write and I teach. Uh, I also build and design things. I am a conceptual architect. I am technical enough. Um, I can code, uh, although I don't very often. 
but I can pretend to be a developer and I can certainly tinker around if I need to. Uh, I've written some books, both fiction and nonfiction, uh, and I make stuff on the internet. I'm, I'm really kind of a generalist. Um, so to be honest with you, this talk is going to go all over the place. Uh, you probably notice my slides are a little messy and there's a couple of different styles. Uh, it's because this talk is really a mashup of a couple of different talks. Um, I just kind of wanted to go far and wide today um, because I think that this topic um, about building bridges between technology and global issues is uh, very complex and can go in a lot of different directions. Um, so that's what I did in this talk. Uh, I'm going to start with the history of Greenpeace because Greenpeace started uh, as something that looks very similar to an open source community. And I think the history is uh, interesting. Uh, I'm going to talk about activism and nonprofits uh, and activism in nonprofits. Uh, I'll talk more about open source, which I guess you guys don't know anything about. Um, and I won't talk a whole lot about cooperatism, um, which is an economic structure that I think is a viable alternative to capitalism, um, which is crumbling <laughs> uh, around our ears as we, as we speak. That didn't really make a lot of sense. Um, anyways, I'll mention it. I'm going to talk about breaking out of silos, um, how important it is that we, open sourcers, technologists, do everything that we can to bridge technology with nonprofit. Uh, and I'm going to talk a bit about open principles like transparency, collaboration, community, adaptability, inclu inclusivity, um, because I truly believe that these principles lead to decentralized power. Uh, when we collaborate across industries, it's all it's all of us who reap the benefits and become empowered. And using open principles and collaborating more broadly um, really helps you live your own values. Uh, and, you know, using transparency in our processes and our decisions also sort of means that we create a pa paper trail about how we've built something, why we've built it that way. Um, and I think that the people, people with a capital P, um, are looking for accountability and transparency allows us to show where the accountability lies. Um, and, and I think that that's a, that's important. So let's start though with a little bit of history. Uh, 34,000 years ago in a large cave in Southern France, um, artists took pigment and painted some of the first known paintings. Uh, there were herds of bison, charging rhinos, leaping gazelle. And the animals, some of them now extinct, were painted in startling detail, but they weren't just portraits of animals. Um, they were animals interacting with other animals and animals interacting with humans and humans interacting with other humans. Um, an interaction is a story. Every interaction is a story. A uh, story is how we remember the past. It is how we imagine the future. It's how we create our very identity. Stories are how we relate to people. Uh, the days of the week are stories that we tell ourselves to organize time. Uh, sicknesses are stories that scientists made up to explain our mortality. Stories are in everything, and everything has a story. Now, stories don't have to be fictional, and they don't have to be artistic. Uh, they don't belong to certain kinds of people. Given that a story or a narrative is present in almost everything that we think, say, or write, theorists often say that after language, it is the most distinctive human trait. Narrative or stories are a central function to the human mind. Now, Greenpeace has a very powerful story, and Greenpeace has always used technology and media to create power. Uh, it's always, it's always done, done this using social networks as well, even before social networks existed. Uh, but before Greenpeace was an organization or an office or a brand uh, or a movement of any kind, it was a ship and it was an action. Uh, so the super short founding version or founding story, it goes like this. In the early 1970s, the U.S. government wanted to test a hydrogen bomb on a small island off the Pacific Northwest called Amchica. 
Now, some folks in Vancouver learned that they wanted to do this and they started to protest because they got scared. Um, their first argument was quite simply, nobody knows what testing a nuclear warhead is going to do to life on or around the island or nearby to the island. I mean, people were worried that if the U.S. Uh, Defense Department dropped this bomb, that it would cause a tidal wave and the tidal wave would come and hit Vancouver. They were worried about radiation poisoning. Uh, and these in these concerned citizens uh, were inspired by Quaker principles and they formed a don't make a wave committee. Um, they protested in the streets uh, they talked to, they talked about their concerns to others. They networked, uh, and were social. <laughs> they formed these networks of people. And as more people became concerned, the U.S. Defense Department didn't actually show any signs of canceling the tests. Uh, so a few of the rabble rousers, uh, they weren't going to give up. Uh, the protests didn't seem to be working. And so the Don't Make a Wave committee decided to take a ship to Amchika. Uh, and pr protest the U.S. nuclear testing at the site itself, at the island. So they threw a benefit concert, and they raised enough money to lease a small fishing trawler called the Phyllis Cormac. The other thing that this group of citizens did, though, uh, the thing that the newly formed Greenpeace did that set a chain of events in motion that would lead to the environmental movement as we know it today, they told stories. Uh, they had a visceral understanding of how to use media and technology to tell inspiring and engaging stories. And because they knew how to do this, people got involved with their cause. The images and the stories of this ragtag group of crazy activists sailing towards a nuclear testing site to put their bodies between a bomb and nature spread around the world. Bob Hunter, one of the founders of Greenpeace, said that the image of them doing this, the story of them sailing out there, was a mind bomb, a story designed to shift perspectives. Here's another mind bomb. Uh, working with ships has allowed Greenpeace to go places that most people can never go and to witness environmental crimes and injustices that would otherwise never be seen. And because we are there, we are impelled to take action because others bear witness with us through the stories that we tell. We hope that other people are also inspired to act. When people think of Greenpeace, often what they think of is daring individuals showing some sort of physical courage. It's the activists standing boldly in the path of the bulldozer in some sort of political or moral act. It's a climber hanging above ra raging waters, showing solidarity for a specific cause. And they think this for two reasons. Number one, it's true. Greenpeace is full of daring and courageous individuals. Number two, we work to spread iconic images and stories. Now, at the moment, there are a variety of dominant stories in the world. Um, some are rational, some are emotional, and both speak to different parts of us. And thus, both can be effective. But to what end? Um, there's a real us versus them story that's been gaining power, particularly in, the, in Western societies over the last few years. Uh, and it's been quite destructive. It relies on this idea that you and your friends are somehow separate from me and my friends, that the color of our skin matters, that where we live matters uh, and, and changes our, our worth, uh, depending. Um, but the thing is, is we're not all that separate. We all eat, drink, laugh, cry. We all need affection. We all feel jealousy. We all feel fear. And we all live in this giant social group called society. Um, we have so much more in common than not. Now, for me, I think that the open source community is actually quite an inclusive place. At least they strive to be. And I think that we all need to go further with our open source attitudes. It is not enough to contribute to a single community, a single project, or a single code base. We need to bring communities together and bring kindred movements together. To that end, I am part of a community of people who are thinking and writing about how we actually do that. Um, we're 
dedicated to teaching others about the open source principles and how they can enhance and ultimately reshape organizational cultures. Uh, and, you know, we kind of explore practicalities around what do we actually have to do to be a truly diverse and inclusive community? What are the principles and mechanisms that lead to cross-sector collaboration? And how do we align and strengthen different projects and issues? Open source, open organizations and projects strive to be inclusive. They not only welcome diverse points of view, but also implement specific mechanisms for inviting multiple perspectives into a dialogue whenever and wherever possible. Now, from a coding perspective, this is basically like doing a code review and making sure that a couple of different people look at the code and say, is it good? How does it look? Are there mistakes? It's about collaboration. Now, Interested parties in open source can just kind of show up. They can start assisting uh, an organization or a code base or a project without seeking express permission. Uh, and the rules and protocols for participation are very clear in a successful open source project. And they operate according to sort of vetted and common standards. But this pinks slash magenta point there at the bottom is what's really key when, it, when we're talking about open source and nonprofits getting together and actually successful open source more generally. We all need to be leaders. We all need to be leaders when it comes to inclusivity and we all need to be leaders when it comes to making sure that we have healthy communities. Like you, I was taught a story of individualism. Um, I was taught that I would have to make my own way uh, that I would struggle to survive, uh, that I, you know, had to follow a particular path to compete, to make money, climb a corporate ladder, that this is normal, uh, this is the way it is. Success means being rich and famous, and the only way to get there is to, to climb, you know, be an individual, unique. Uh, but somewhere along the way, I really learned a different story and the first time that I interacted with the open source project, uh, I saw something different. Effective, inclusive leadership is something different. And it seems weird to say that because when you think of leadership, you should be thinking that somebody is effective and inclusive. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. The reason for that is because we are groomed to understand hierarchies and authorities and seniorities. Uh, but once I realized that I had the power to see myself and my place in the world a bit differently, that I had the power to actively resist the status quo, I started to use it. All of the communities that I spend my time around, from the activist community to the open source community to the cooperative community, they've all started to have conversations about how empathy, solidarity, and collective effort can shift the balance and change the pervasive narratives in our world. I said it a few minutes ago, I'm going to say it again, it is not enough to contribute to a single community project or code base. We have to bring these communities together. They are kindred movements and bringing them together is beneficial for everyone. So this is what I do uh, with my cooperative. Uh, we Are Open Co-op is a six member collective. Uh, we come from the world of open source, uh, but all of us have very different origin stories and our, our careers have taken different paths. So we're a particularly well connected and creative bunch of folks. Um, we each have networks of people who are trying in their own ways to make the world a better place. And what we do is we help organizations find and implement strategies for becoming more open and participatory. Now, I explain participatory as the difference between a lecture and a conversation. Um, it's the difference between passive and active. So centering on a community's interests and facilitating connections inside and outside of that, those communities really helps organizations produce something that is valuable for their own community. And if it's open, it's valuable for the, for the rest of the world as well, because people can take it and remix it and do something new with it. Um, but all of this happens in context. 
we have to lead differently to make impact. We have to be innovative and fail forward and take more risks and all that other stuff that the tech community says. Um, but part of transitioning to this new mode of being, um, this new mode of working is about overcoming aspects of our identities and our emotions um, that we've had instilled upon us from a very early age. Uh, we have to reflect on and give tribute to the social and cultural norms that define us because those norms are the reason that we do or do not get involved, that we do or do not collaborate well, that we do or do not empower our communities. Now, open decision-making is an approach to arriving at actionable agreements through participatory practices. It's a framework that helps you dist distribute leadership within your community. Several years ago, I remixed the openly licensed open decision framework uh, that an open organization ambassador was working on and adjusted it for an internal Greenpeace leadership audience. Um, Greenpeace was looking to replace their web platform. And as the project kicked off, uh, we helped the leadership understand why, run, why we should run it as an open source project. We had big ambitions and social enterprises tend to fund things that directly impact their missions as opposed to technology. Uh, nonprofits are often in bootstrapping mode when it comes to technology because they just don't have enough resources. Uh, and because they're nonprofit, they don't pay as well as the for-profit tech space. And I think that open source can help by giving technologists a way to contribute to nonprofit missions with their time and their skills. So this platform that we've been building is called Planet 4. Planet 4 is the code name for the engagement platform we're building at Greenpeace. Uh, from a global perspective, it is the digital front door to the organization. We've rolled out in over 80% of our national and regional offices uh, all over the world in multiple languages. From a systems perspective, um, this means that we have a very complex landscape of technologies because different different countries are using different systems and we have to find ways to bring those systems together while providing an engagement experience that is localized. Software customizations, security audits, continuous integrations, Selenium, Jenkins, GitFlow, um, shared services, multi-instance approach. Uh, the platform is built on, uh, on top of WordPress, which we contribute back to and I mean, quite simply, the Planet 4 team is building technology for a global organization, and there's a lot to say about tech, which means that we need plenty of different kinds of skills. This is true of all nonprofits. They need better tech, too. They live in the same world that we do. Um, with insights from 55 interviews, two conferences, and more than 350 survey respondents working at the intersection of open source and social good, GitHub recently re released a comprehensive report that explores the opportunities and barriers that the social sector faces when using open source. So we know that the majority of open source contributors are not in the US and likely not English speaking. We know that experts in technology for social good uh, speak about missed opportunities um, in low social sector participation in the open source ecosystem. Nonprofits can extend local audiences and networks into the open source space, which maximizes budgets, builds better tech, bridges, bridges gaps, and aligns with shared values. So we recently did another survey asking open source contributors what motivates them to contribute. And we discovered that the overwhelming majority of people uh, who responded contribute to open source because of their values. Um, the GitHub report also quoted a 2018 a paper called the Technology for Social Justice Project and saying that free and open source uh, software is seen by many practitioners as crucial to growing and sustaining the ecosystem because its values are consistent with their goals of equity and social justice. And because in practice, it's, it enables resource sharing around technology development rather than competition. 
There's so much in common between activists and open source communities. Nonprofits are all about values too. We know that Greenpeace attracts a variety of supporters from a wide range of people. Um, so we're pretty confident that technologists and open source advocates would be willing to contribute to Greenpeace because there are values that everybody can get behind. So I hear you wondering aloud, how do we actually bring these communities together? And in order to cooperate with nonprofits, the secret is, is that the open source community just has to do what it does best, start to get involved, pick up tasks, show up to open calls, do the little bit of extra like work of looking outside of your favorite open source project and find ways to contribute to organizations that need help. The re reality of most nonprofits is that they need folks who are willing to roll up their sleeves and just get to work. And that includes in technology. Those of us who believe in open principles strive to design our nonprofit projects to be as participatory and collaborative uh, as an open source project by creating structures um, in which community members have agency. Um, there's a, a lot of different techniques, um, but to, to help people have agency, but my top three are really simple ones. Uh, community calls, individual outreach, and listening. Uh, of course, there's more to it. We know what motivates open source contributors. Um, we know because we ask them. And with Greenpeace's Planet 4 project, um, we're designing architectures of participation to scaffold con contributor engagement. So we're actively inviting people in. We are planning and executing initiatives that are designed to model open engagement and demonstrate the benefits of open engagement in practice. Uh, we are beginning to forge new partnerships and relationships, which will help not only Greenpeace, but other nonprofits strategically by connecting them to technologists. We're showcasing best practices to, to show how much overlap between nonprofits and open source there is. And we're starting to gain useful contributions that go both ways, both from technology to, to nonprofit and the other way around. For Greenpeace, you're invited to swing by, get set up on our dev environment, leave us contact info, contribute some time in the future. Uh, we're currently cleaning up our contrib contribution documentation. Uh, we spent the last year and a half or so uh, implementing uh, the software across Greenpeace. And now we're sort of doubling down on open source contribution and getting people to volunteer for Greenpeace uh, through open source initiatives. Um, so we're working on that now. We're, tr we're transferring a bunch of contributor friendly tasks, uh, to GitHub slash Greenpeace slash Planet4, uh, which is probably empty when you're reading this, but this is work that's live happening now. Um, but you know, Greenpeace isn't the only nonprofit that could use your skills. So if you're not interested in, in Greenpeace, that's okay because there's so much you can learn from reaching out to your local nonprofits and offering your help. Uh, do a search, look at their websites, uh, look at the initiatives that they're running. Think about how you can contribute, you know, your favorite technology, your skills to those nonprofits, and then give them a call. Uh, tell them that you want to support, support their mission by helping them with technology or design or outreach or whatever your passion and skill set is. Um, Nonprofits need all the help they can get, and they don't just need money. They need us to step up and do the work. Um, build relationships and understand that when you give your time and energy, you receive a great many things. You know this from open source. You're going to learn things. Uh, you're going to get social credit, you know, and maybe most importantly, you're going to get an inner validation because you know that the work you do is helping to make the world a better Place. So here's a couple ways you can get in touch. I'm very responsive. Thank you so much for listening and enjoy the rest of your conference. And welcome back. Thanks very much to Laura for her talk. Um, right now we're going to have a 
discussion with Robert. Um, and before we start our conversation with him, uh, I just wanted to let you know we are aware of the sound issues in the live call. Um, it's a software problem. Um, so, so sorry for that. It happens to us too. Um, it's, uh, sadly, not something we can fix easily. So hopefully um, it's okay and it, uh, the experience doesn't uh, suffer too much. Um, nevertheless, Robert, welcome. Yes, hi. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's great to talk to you in person. Um, just something be before I uh, kick off, uh, I wanted to um, say I did see some discussions going on in Big Blue Button right now with Laura. And uh, thanks, thanks, thanks so much for engaging with us, um, giving us this uh, inspirational talk and, and, and starting a conversation. And, you know, even though not you know, all the uh, opinions expressed in that talk uh, may be shared by us, um, that is exactly what we're looking for, something to to discuss and, and share our uh, perspectives on on topics and um, you know we all grow from from those exchanges and that brings me right right on topic um, I saw some some parallels between Laura's talk and, and your keynote Robert so I wanted to touch on a couple of points um, open source and contributing and the motivation for contributing you've been doing that for years and years and years what motivates you personally to do that yeah it's i mean contributing to an open source project is a bit different than uh, contributing to what a company does i that's at least what i discovered for me that um it's not so much about uh, like achieving a certain project goal or things like that at least not in the long term that's not what would make me tick to or invest spare time for many years you know that's that's not it um, but as i said already uh, in, in the keynote so for me personally it's mostly about the social context the challenges finding the people who um, are there for different reasons than uh, just commercial reasons. Um, and that that is not just because I, I dislike earning money or something, uh, but more like um, because they have that reason of uh, finding a challenge to find exchange uh, of thoughts and discussions and so on. Um, the kind of the right people and also a diverse uh, group of people will find together and that's what made it so so interesting in, in the beginning and until now and what you just said uh, sparked something in me I remember a retrospective um, a couple of years ago I think it was in Hamburg when we actually as a team sat together and talked about why why we contribute to the NEOS project and there were a lot of people there who said it's it's not primarily about writing a content management system or writing a PHP framework. Um, being part of the NEOS community and contributing to this open source project is um, about me being part of the community, of this team, of this group of people who share my values um, and where I feel, you know, my contributions valued. So um, I... I you know, I, I share the view you Yeah, expressed. absolutely. I mean, Laura showed uh, some this, this diagram there of uh, motivation for open source contributions. And of course, I mean, we know about that as well. And, and that's also the case for, for us. So people have different motivations, but they usually circle around a certain theme which you have in open source projects. And um, for example, uh, th that's what a thought I liked about this uh, talk also was uh, uh, social credit is quite important for motivation also in open source projects. So I remember um, how that felt when I first appeared in some change log or copyright notice uh, in, in Typo 3 core back then. So that, that really makes something like you feel proud that you contributed. Um, but there are other ways. I mean, not just... Um, being proud of something but uh, giving getting feedback and um, like I mentioned that uh, Elasticsearch package you mentioned it as well and uh, the reason why I mentioned it is that 
I talked to Daniel and he said like, I mean, there must be so many people being interested in that. There are 100,000 downloads of this package, but he didn't get any, any feedback. And that's something we need to take care of. Yeah, to keep so that is something motivated. that we can encourage from from the community as well. Um, when you when you use packages um, and and they're useful to you, um, let let the maintainer know um, they're, they're doing a really hard job maintaining packages, and um, they they would love your feedback. You know, if you're very happy, then let them know. It encourages them to continue contributing to their package. Contribute by telling them what can be improved. That's a huge benefit that I get to contribute in some of the times is that I use a package and I realize, oh, if in my specific edge case of installing it this way and another, there is a feature that doesn't work entirely. I had that conversation with um, Sebastian Hetzle for the SEO package where um, something didn't work. It was a multi-page something installed, but I don't know. And it, something didn't work. And I messaged him and he said, oh, oh, I haven't tried it in that constellation. Thank you. And I mean, even that is a, contrib and it's a, is a feedback to him that, look, I'm using your thing and it's great, but can we make it greater? And that brings, um, me, that brings me to a statement, Robert, and, and then that's your cue. Yeah. Um, technology is social. Is it? Absolutely. I mean... <laughs> Um, because it's too complex to not being social. Um, it, you cannot do that, uh, solve these problems alone. You need a lot of uh, social interaction in order to get the knowledge and also to get feedback. And that is also so so enriching, like uh, you're working on something and then you can, maybe you can ask your colleague for feedback in your company, but um, even your colleague is living in the same box more or less like you he might or she might be a different uh, type of person but being able to get feedback from a whole community of people from even different countries and different cultures um, that enables you to do much more and and be able to to solve much uh, more challenging pro uh, projects or problems and you know as laura said uh Life is a story, right? We're social animals and uh, stories are very important to us. So finding out what our contributions did for and you know, to other people, how it influenced their, their projects and that the work they're doing is getting recognized is, is, is very important to us. So that, that goes both, way, both ways. Um, we as a core team, we often talk about making sure that first-time contributors are acknowledged and supported and how we handle if there is a nitpick we, we may be fined in, you know, in, a, in a contribution. Maybe you can touch a little bit on, on that, how, yeah, how we handle that. Yeah, I think uh, one kind of yeah, important thing for us uh, in, in the NEOS community is empowerment. And that also has much to do with uh, the hierarchy on, or the lack of hierarchy we have. So that doesn't mean that um, there, there is nobody like taking specific roles you would have in the hierarchy. That's absolutely needed. So um, usually when you have some kind of management role in, in companies, for example, or have someone who uh, takes a look at the big picture of something in, in a certain area like marketing or um, technology and so on. We also need the, these people who have these roles, but it doesn't have to be a hierarchy, right? And it's, it's just one of these jobs you need to do. And because we do it that way, I think that people feel empowered uh, that they can take decisions, um, even though they, they don't play a management role. And that results in a lot of creative solutions we have and hopefully motivate people. And there was one more thing in, in Laura's presentation, and for me that was leading by example. Uh, we as a core team, what we do um, is viewed 
a little differently than what other community members do and and uh, how we act uh, is it uh, conversations we have on social media is it how we discuss uh, on github and you know pull requests issues and so on and so on what we write there when we close issues when we reject them for certain reasons and it is it is difficult to um, have those different contexts in mind, right? When you're talking to a team member who you've known maybe for a decade or more and you have a very intimate relationship and, you know, the basis for conversation is, is very personal and then you switch context to a new time, first time contributor and you, you, you find something and you think, oh, uh, I need to comment on that. That's something we've, you know, discussed many, many times in the past. Um, do you, do you, actively think about that when you when you have conversations about these different contexts and that you are seen as a, as a leader uh, for this project and the, this open source community yes and uh, with some pain also involved so because I absolutely know that I cannot expect something from others which uh, I don't do myself so as I said um, being that example, I mean, I'm just one of these lots of examples again, but um, for example, if I look at something which has changed in NEOS or Flow and I don't agree with the change or, you know, I stumble over it, um, I, I simply can't complain about it because I, I didn't take the time to get involved into that particular topic. And so... Um, that first reaction you have, like like uh, trying to overrule someone because because prob probably you just can, um, that doesn't make sense. So you need to find another way to to think about the reasoning and to try to find a discussion about it and and yeah, just take the time and and improve it yourself. Thank you very much, Robert, for your insights and reflections on the topics raised by uh, Laura's talk about the realities of nonprofits. Um, I think the time of our video call is over. Thank you very much. We will have the pleasure of hearing you again tomorrow with another talk. Tomorrow. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Robert. Bye-bye.